Many people are familiar with the Trail of Tears. However, few know the history of our forced confinement in internment camps just before our removal west. In this Cherokee Almanac, we introduce a commonly overlooked and devastating chapter in our tribe's history. After ratification of the Treaty of Nui Chota in 1835, Cherokee people living east of the Mississippi River were given two years to voluntarily immigrate to Indian Territory. The 1835 treaty ended what had been a tense relationship between the two nations. Over the next three years, the federal government completed its plans for Cherokee removal, triggering what many today know as the Trail of Tears. I don't think there's any way that we can look at a moment like removal and not see it by the definitions of ethnic cleansing today. This is a moment of attempting to wholesale remove a group of people based on their race and ethnicity out of a region into another region. And, and the UN is pretty unequivocal about what these things are defined like today. And we have to think through that lens for the case of removal. These clearances that are going on are very reminiscent of uh, the early stages of the Holocaust. You know, where, where it's moving people out, moving people away, and then putting another people in possession of their property and of you know, their homes and everything else. There was always the idea that we would be able to stave off removal, and that ultimately did not come to pass. But there was, there was always hope that that removal would be avoided. Principal Chief Ross had advised people to, to plant your crops, we'll still be here. We'll still be here to harvest them. And um, unfortunately, they started to round people up for, for the stockades and, and, and place them into these holding pens and these holding facilities. Between May and June of 1838, more than 15,000 Cherokee men, women, and children had been driven from their homes, many at Bayonet Point, and marched hundreds of miles under guard to stockades in present-day Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. The stockades were part of a vast network of camps built by the federal government strategically near Cherokee communities during the years leading up to the Trail of Tears. The stockades were designed as temporary holding points for imprisoned Cherokees along their forced removal west. Each stockade had a designated route to a larger transit camp termed immigration depots, which were considered the final staging points of removal west. So you have groups of 30, 100, 200 people, up to 1,500 people coming into these outlying forts and then being moved in groups of several hundred, up to 1,200 people from these outlying forts. They're, they're sort of concentrated and then moving down to, you know, those larger immigration depots at Fort Cass, Ross's Landing, Gunner's Landing, where people were supposed to be put onto boats almost immediately, put onto steamboats and flatboats and taken down the Tennessee River and, and on out to the west. That was the original plan for moving everyone, you know, that this would all happen very, very quickly. And of course, it did not work out that way at all. Three detachments of Cherokees departed from Ross's Landing in June 1838, and hundreds perished along the way. In an effort to avoid further loss, the Cherokee Council petitioned the federal government to postpone removal until fall. Although their request was granted, the camps could no longer hold the number of people imprisoned there. Many Cherokees were forced outside the stockades with little shelter, food, or water amidst one of the hottest summers on historic record. We need to remember that the bulk of the deaths related to removal happened relative to disease in those, in those internment camps leading up to removal and also post-removal. That disease is running rampant, that food sources are, are, are not good quality, that it's often foreign food that is not part of Cherokee people's diet, so that's diminishing their health. Smallpox, cholera, these are all things that the Cherokee people are facing in those camps and are going to face post-removal when they've even arrived in their destination. 
For the duration of the summer of 1838, Cherokees remained captive around the immigration depots, oftentimes less than 100 miles from their homes and farms. In a matter of months, lands inhabited by Cherokee people for thousands of years were taken over by encroaching white settlers. And those are their first houses, you know, as they've taken over these farms. They're taking over farms with apple orchards and peach orchards and fenced fields, you know, and moving in on that. But in some cases, you know, when the, the arrests were actually going on, there were gangs of people following the soldiers and burning the houses down so that people couldn't return to their homes. It becomes part of the part of the myth and part of the legend in these local communities. You know, they know this has happened. The forts, when the federal government's done, they go vacant. They're used, in some cases, they're used as the cores of the, the towns that grow up on those locations. We have a number of instances where forts and blockhouses become post offices. You know, we didn't see in this country the, at least the explicit direction to a final solution. The outcome is very similar in, in some cases. When you have uh, thousands and thousands of indigenous people die uh, as a result of these operations. This is a solution. And, and you know, for Jackson's government, it was a solution to the Indian problem. 